things have to be Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know Well, now they know Let it go, let it go Can't hold it back anymore let it go. Unless you've been living in an underground bunker on a small Mediterranean island for the past six years with a blindfold and horse blinders and earplugs, you probably know what that is. That's Let It Go, the big song from the Disney film Frozen. Do you have any idea how popular that song is? Like, if you go onto YouTube and find the, quote, sing-along version, how many views do you think it has? Peter Del Vecco is the Oscar-winning producer of Frozen. He's sitting across from me right now. Any guesses on how many views that might have? I, I don't know. I do know that the al- album went triple platinum, but just the number of people that have embraced that song around the world is is astounding. 1.7 billion. Wow. One, so just for reference, if you were to play that song on repeat 1.7 billion times, it's 13,000 years. <laughs> it's insane. That's, that's incredible. I mean, and it's, it's pretty amazing, but it tells you a lot about the impact that Frozen has had, how many households that have had it on repeat continuously since 2013. And the reason Peter's sitting across from me right now is because Frozen 2 is on the way, November 21st. The trailer already racking similar kind of numbers. 58 million as we speak, and that'll probably triple by the time I finish the sentence. Welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you, it's good to be here. I got a a Canadian show and all, I gotta mention that I heard that some of the ice cracking in the original Frozen was recorded in Canada. That's true, our our sound designer, Odin Benitez, took a trip and he actually put microphones under the ice to get that sound of it just moving and cracking and that we used uh, quite a bit in the first movie. Yeah, you said, I think a lot of your people went to Canada the first time around. We did, we did some research. We also um, went to Quebec to stay in the ice hotel. Um, Our head of story, uh, Norm LeMay, is from Quebec. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of uh, tie-ins with Canada. Can you do me a favor? I uh, I think a producer of a show, of a film like this, is a very mysterious job title to a lot of people. What does a typical day look like for you as producer of Frozen 2? Well, I can tell you, I, I usually arrive around 7.30 and I usually leave around 8 o'clock at night. And whatever I think my day is going to be when I get there, it always turns out to be something different, which is what's great about working there. But I, I work closely with the directors trying to get their creative vision up on the screen. It's everything from helping them cast to helping with story to basically getting the movie uh, uh, produced. How many people are we talking working on a movie um, like this? Uh, there's uh, probably about... Uh, uh, I mean, it starts very small. We start with, you know, five or six people working on the movie, uh, but we crew up to around a little over 300. And of course, there's all these other people at the studio that also support the film. Is it a part of you that gets to be also creative? In, in, oh, of in course. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, Chris and Jen are the main creative forces, as is Bobby and Kristen, the songwriters. But I get to play the uh, the role of uh, devil's advocate sometimes or, or just to give them a different perspective and can contribute uh, when I can to the creative process. When did you know, because, you know, there's been a lot of really big Disney movies and there's been a lot of really big, of course, animated films. But when did you know that, was there a moment you knew that Frozen was going to be bigger than just your average film? Well, I say when we went to the first preview of Frozen, we knew we had something special, but I don't think anybody could have predicted uh, the phenomena it became. I mean, we felt we had a good film, but it really sort of took on a life of its own. Um, and uh, it was fun just to sit back and watch the world uh, uh, make it their own. Was there a moment where you were like, you know, sitting on the side of the road and a car drives by blasting Let It Go or anything? You know, I think uh, it was actually... Uh, Social media was sort of just coming into form. It's the first movie I'd worked on. So YouTube uh, was a way for us to watch fans from around the world kind of reacting to the movie. Yeah. And we were we were passing YouTube videos back and forth. Did you see this one? Did you see that one? It was it was a it was a fun time. I mean, was it more was it more than just the content and the songs in the film that made it really big? Was it at the time it came out? Like, have you had any? Have you had any quiet moments to think, why did this thing get so big? I think it's because people weren't expecting it. I think it's, um, uh, we dealt with really universal themes in the movie. And uh, there were a lot of tropes that, that, uh, we flipped on its on its end. What do you mean? Um, you know, Prince Charming, uh, uh, that it takes a, 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 the uh, love of a prince, the romantic love of a prince to, you know, thaw the frozen heart. So all those things, I think, added uh, to uh, kind of the excitement of the movie and, and watching that. I mean, we honored those tropes. Um, we didn't make fun of them. Uh, they were valid tropes. We just put our own twist on them. 
And then Elsa, right? I mean, yes. Elsa just becomes the biggest thing in the entire world. I, I will say that, like, I, I hadn't seen the film, and I knew Let It Go. Yeah. And I knew who Elsa was. Sure. Because I had seen her on, you know, you know, people's book bags and, you yeah. know, people in the office and stuff like that. I want to talk about that in a second. But I found this out that the year after Frozen came out, the, the film, Elsa made it onto the list of the 500 most common names in the U.S. for the first time since 1917. I, I heard that as well. That's crazy. Yeah. What did you, what what was it about Elsa? You know, Elsa's one of those great sort of mythic characters that that we slightly fear for her, we slightly understand her, um, uh, we root for her, um, but we're always slightly afraid uh, she's going to meet some tragic fate. And yet, uh, uh, you know, with our help, we sort of persevere through. And certainly with Anna bringing the fairy tale character, fairy tale ending to it, it all ended well for them. I um, I didn't know this till you mentioned it this morning. But can you can you repeat what you said this morning about how? It's a, Frozen 2 is a sequel. There aren't that many sequels in the history of Disney Animation. No, right? we've actually, this is the fourth sequel that Disney Animation has done of any of our movies. And it's the first uh, um, animated movie that's also a musical. It's the first time we've attempted a sequel on one of our films that was a musical. Yeah, and, and low, low pressure. Yeah, low pressure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, low, we low set risk. the bar pretty high uh, the first time around. Are you worried about that at all? You know, it, we have the exact same creative team on the movie, and, and uh, uh, we, always let, we always let the story tell us what it needs to be. We follow that. At some point, that's the exciting part for us is when it starts to tell us what it needs to be. Yeah. And sometimes that's very different from where we started. But uh, well, if we just follow that journey, um, uh, it's a film that we all end up wanting to see. And listen, I know, I know there's only so much you can say, and you're, you're here because of your job and all that stuff. But really, it must be. I mean, the, the, you can't possibly be expecting it to be as big and life-changing as Frozen was, or maybe it can. Well, what we want is, uh, you know, we set our own bar pretty high. We don't want to p disappoint audiences. We don't want to disappoint our own crew in the studio. We all have high expectations of the film, and I think the world clearly has high expectations. Hopefully, we, we've met it. I, I hope so, too, man, because it's, it, 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 well, it's, I, what I saw this morning was really beautiful, and, and, Great. and I, I really got a kick out of it. Have you had any parents who have had to listen to Frozen the soundtrack 13,000 times give you a hard time ever in your life? Uh, you know, I think everyone loved the song when it came out. Of course, the number of times it gets played um, uh, by kids, I think uh, there have been parents who, who feel like they've heard it one too many times. However, they also admit that they still love the song yeah. and they occasionally sing it in the car. Right. So you haven't had too many, you know, friends of friends of friends call you up and no. go, how could you do this to me? <laughs> no. But it's interesting, you know, because in some ways the people who grew up with the original Frozen, you know, say if you watched that when you were 10 or even if you watched that when you were 12, you're 16 years old, you're 18 years old now. I mean, you must be coming across people who Frozen is a part of their growing up. It's part of their growing up, and truthfully, in this movie, um, our characters, Anna, Elsa, all of them, are actually maturing, so they're in a different phase of their life as well. So I think it will, again, it will relate to um, how everyone who saw the first film is also maturing. Oh, that's and that's a hard line to walk, hey? Trying to bring in new kids who, who mm -hmm. we know want to see the movie for the first time while also trying sure. to extend the story for those who have gotten older. Yes. That's the challenge. If you're just tuning in, um, my guest is Peter Del Vecco, the producer of Frozen and now Frozen 2. Uh, which comes out on November 21st. Uh, Peter is the Senior Vice President of Production for Disney Animation, which basically means he oversees all of the Disney animated films that came out. And you started working at Disney in 95? 95, 24 years ago. What was it like back then? Very different environment. Uh, so. um, uh, they had just come off of Lion King, and I think with the success of Lion King, um, they they anticipated every film after that would have the success, and it got away from being a filmmaker-driven studio. That's what I love is that um, uh, now it's clearly a... Uh, filmmaker-driven studio. In other words, the directors, the producers, they make the films that they want to make, and, and uh, we're given the freedom to do that. Well, what are some of your earliest memories of working at Disney? Because to me, I mean, in, in some ways, it's a corporate environment one and all that stuff. It but is, in some ways, it's also like a magical place, right? Disney animation has always had a unique environment to it. It's very artist-driven. Um, uh, it, it feels small to us. It doesn't feel like a big corporation. We're, we're uh, quite a bit of family. Um, and when I first walked in, you know, all we were doing hand-drawn movies back then, and all the artists who were just so talented, the background artists, it's exciting. And really, that hasn't changed today, except the medium has changed. Has, has this changed? I mean, Disney, when you started, was... 
I mean, it was still the biggest company, but it's even gotten bigger in the past yes. few years. I mean, you, you looked at Disney now owns Pixar and Star Wars, the Avengers, I mean, the Simpsons. Um, has that changed your job at all? Um, at its core, no. I mean, obviously, we're aware of all these other divisions, and certainly working with Pixar is great. We have a lot of friends up there, and they, you know, they do incredible work, and I admire the work they do, and and vice versa. So that's been that's been a fun experience. Um, it, you know, when I look at when I look at the past, maybe little while of Disney, I do think about the Lion King, the remake of the Lion King, the remake of Aladdin. Is looking for original stories like a Frozen, and now with Frozen 2, is looking for original stories still part of Disney Animation's mandate? Oh, it absolutely is part of it. Um, we love original uh, property. I mean, obviously Frozen was the last time it came out, um, uh, and, and rarely do we do sequels, but Frozen, uh, we felt there was more story to tell. Clearly the, the world was anticipating another Frozen. It seemed like a natural are you, but you're still hunting around for new original stories. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have uh, original story. Um, uh, uh, the film after Frozen comes out, uh, Raya uh, and the Last Dragon um, uh, is also original story. Are you also looking for, and this may be a bit of an odd question, but I'm a folklorist. Sure. So I, I, I like the Hans Christian Andersen-ness of, of yes. Frozen. You know, I like the Snow White of the Seven Dwarves being sure. a, you know, a, a folktale. Are you guys still look, like to me the genius of early Disney was it was the stories your mom would tell you before you went to bed on TV or on a film. I mean, are you guys still looking for those film, those stories or is the well sort of run dry? No, I don't think that. there's plenty of stories out there. There's plenty of stories around the world, some of which we may not be familiar with here that are very interesting stories that are worth bringing to the to the screen. I don't know how much you can say about this because I know you know I know what your job is. But you know, when you see reviews of the Lion King, the live action we'll, we'll call it live action Lion King or the live action Aladdin. And you know, there, I remember I read one in the Guardian and then there was a couple others that said, "Ah, oh, you know, this it's it's fine, but it's never going to live to the magic of the original animation. Does that bother you or does that, you know, in terms of your animation brain go like, yeah, you know, we're doing pretty good? You know, there are two different mediums. Um, uh, you know, animation, what we do, um, we don't create, we, we create a believable world, not necessarily a realistic one, and we take people on a journey. Um, the live action is a different journey. It's telling, but it's still telling uh, wonderful stories that uh, originated with Disney animation. Do you think there's going to be a, a live action Frozen? Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, There's a laser no, pointer. It, just... it is. It is not uh, currently in the plans. I feel like I'm. I'm feeling about Watergate or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I feel like Haldeman. Uh, we hold uh, Frozen very dear to our hearts, and uh, uh, we love this property and, and look forward to. Uh, sharing more of it. You know, it's interesting though. You mentioned when you came into Disney, the Lion King was the biggest, you know, the biggest thing in the world, and they were trying to repeat the success of the Lion King. Um, that was back when there was nothing to do but see a movie. You know what I mean? And sure. I, and like, and listen, I was I'm of the generation that. Uh, I think uh, Frank, our producer, put it this way, that it's the cassette became sort of essential reading. You yes. know what I mean? Like I had the Aladdin cassette, sure. the Aladdin VHS, the Lion King VHS. I didn't have The Little Mermaid, but I knew people who did in Beauty and the Beast. And this was, this was how we spent all of our time. Mm -hmm. Now I look at a time when, you know, there's shows on, endless opportunities to watch things online, not just on Disney+, Plus, not sure. just on Netflix, but also on YouTube. Um, the, the options are so many. How, how does Disney animation stand out at a time like this? Well, I think we continue to make big films, uh, epic films, epic journeys that uh, hopefully people want to see uh, 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 with their family, with an audience. Um, I always feel you get far more out of the film seeing it sort of as a group experience. I think comedy plays better in, in, in a theater. So uh, it, it seems like it didn't hurt the first movie. So um, <laughs> I think we're in good shape. Do you uh, do you have kids who are into Frozen? I do. Well, I had I have I have have uh, twins. They're now twenty two, but they were just finishing high school when the first one came out. And uh, uh, what was interesting is as soon as they saw their friends reacting to it, um, they were they were very excited about. I mean, they liked Frozen, but um, I think when. Uh, we won the Oscar. My daughter tweeted me. Did she didn't say congratulations? She said, "Hey, Dad, you just made me Twitter famous." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they have their own fondness of it, but all their friends loved it too. I bet they were proud. I bet they were proud. They of, were uh, very proud of everyone of their dad. 
Sure. I'm, I'm sure. Um, do, you, do, you, do you think you have another Let It Go in your hands in Frozen 2? We have seven new songs. There, uh, Elsa has two songs. They're both incredible songs. I think all the songs are really powerful in this movie. It'll be fun to watch uh, uh, the public react to all of them. You've been very, very giving, very, very generous. I'm going to ask perhaps the hardest question of okay. all. Are you a little tired of Let It Go at this point? You know, I, I will, and this is the truth. Uh, we have friends who sometimes visit and they want to watch Frozen. Frozen is one of the few movies that I can watch again. I, I love these characters. I love the world that was created. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the second one even more. Well, you know, congratulations on the film. Um, from I think I got to see about, what, 20 minutes of it this morning, and I can't wait to see the rest. Terrific. Thanks for coming in, man. Thank you.